Okay, it looks like we have about everyone or all the people at the beginning of this anyways. My name is Dave Bjorlin. I am on the executive committee of the Hymn Society for two more days. Um, and I am very excited to welcome you to this uh, showcase of All Creation Sings, the new ELCA uh, supplement. And uh, I'm excited to introduce you to three of the people that will be sharing. So uh, first, Jennifer Baker Trinity uh, is a deacon in the ELCA. She lives outside of the Twin Cities and is program director for resource development and splits her time between the denominational offices and 1517 Media, Augsburg Fortress. I'm not sure of the difference between all of those, but in there somewhere. Um, John, John White is deacon in the ELCA as well. Um, he's assistant to the bishop and executive for worship, I believe is the title. And um, he is in Chicago and I believe also goes to Holy Trinity which I have occasionally gone to myself uh, near where I live. And David Sims is a composer, a cantor at Holy Trinity in Minneapolis and is the music development manager for 1517 Media in Augsburg Fortress. Um, and they were all, I'm sure, influential in putting together this uh, wonderful resource that I've already used many, many times in my own worship uh, context here in Chicago. So I'll turn it over to them. Thank you so much, Dave. Uh, like you said, my name is David Sims. Uh, I'm the music development manager at Augsburg Fortress. Uh, I'm the cancer at Holy Trinity in uh, Minneapolis. And Jen and John and I are part of the core team of people uh, who um, help put together uh, All Creation Sings along with countless others. Uh, we were joined in the office with our colleagues, uh, Suzanne Burke, and our vice president and publisher, Martin Seltz, and your Hymn Society treasurer. We are so thankful for all those also who have uh, offered audio and visual um, aids today um, because we can't be together in person. So I bet all of you have formative moments in your life when you remember falling in love with hymns. And those moments probably happened with a hymnal in your hand and other worshipers beside you. Your story has an arc to it, starting when you fell in love with hymns and tracing a line until this very moment, learning about new hymns with your Hymn Society colleagues. So today our tour of All Creation Sings will also have a narrative arc to act as a framework. Our pillars will be the very first line of the very first hymn, now the heavens start to whisper as the veil is growing thin, and the very last line of the very last hymn, in gratitude and worship, my being sings to you. Now, to be clear, this isn't how the book was put together, but tracing the theological implications connecting those lyrics might be an interesting lens through which we can consider the 200 hymns and songs that make up the main body of this supplement. So today we'll imagine how the first line, now the heavens start to whisper as the veil is growing thin, teaches us the way that creation invites us to sing right now in this very time. The ways that we can whisper as well as shout and the ways that we can see the veil between us and the divine growing thin. The last line, in gratitude, in worship, my being sings to you, invites us to consider how we respond to creation's invitation by being grateful how we respond with our whole selves, and how we are called to worship and praise. So let's start at the very beginning, hymn 901. <laughs> Bringle's final stanza ends with this line, Child who comes to grace the manger, teach our hearts to welcome you. What a great way to frame what we do as church musicians and creative artists, 
teaching our hearts and the hearts of others to welcome God. And when should we sing praise to God? Creation's answer is very clear. Now, without delay. When should we publish a worship supplement? The ELC's answer was now, but after lots of research and conversation. So All Creation Sings is the latest worship resource for the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Our primary hymnal is called Evangelical Lutheran Worship, published in 2006. It's a vibrant cranberry red. We technically call it a worship book because it also contains uh, sung and spoken liturgical settings, prayers, Luther's small catechism, other resources that support the whole of an assembly's worship life. The Evangelical Lutheran worship family was always meant to grow and support the worship needs of the ELCA. And so after focused research, conversation, the adoption of social teaching and policy documents over the last 15 years, this was the right time to publish a supplement. All Creation Sings, clad in a, a deep coordinating purple color, uh, includes two new musical settings of Holy Communion, uh, one that's uh, bilingual English and Spanish, and one that has options specifically for evening use. A service of word and prayer, a brief service to follow a violent event, uh, and other prayers, thanksgivings, and laments. And the priorities for the new assembly song, the new hymns uh, included, were texts about aging, dying, life transitions, care of creation, healing, justice, peace, uh, sending that had a connection with mission and worship, texts that related to revised common lectionary texts for which we needed more options, uh, and hymns from a variety of musical styles, poets, composers, uh, especially female, female identifying composers and text writers who have been underrepresented in public hymnals. So uh, hymn 949, uh, Keep Your Lamps, says it best. Stay ready. Stay alert to what the Spirit is saying. And the church was ready. We had well over a thousand submissions from the public, from poets and composers and music leaders who were continuing to create and share new hymns. As creation tells us that now is the time to praise and prepare, let's listen to Lutheran songwriter Jonathan Rudman teach us his new hymn, which asks the question, could it be that we are called for such a time as this? We'll know the words of the song together. It goes like this. Could it be, could it be that, we are called that we are called for such a time as this? That's the song. So I'll sing it for you one time, and you can listen and learn how it goes. It sounds like this. Could it be that we are called for such a time as this? Could it be that we are called for such a time? That's it. Let's sing that together. Here we go. Could it be that we are called for such a time as this? Could it be that we are called for such a time as this? All right. Let's try verse two and let's sing you are called. Here we go. Could it be that you are called for such a time as this? Could it be that you are called for such a time as this? All right. Greetings. I am also glad to be with you and with my colleagues, David and John, uh, this morning as we introduce to you All Creation Sings. As Dave mentioned, I'm Jennifer Baker Trinity and I'm coming to you today from outside of um, the Twin Cities in Shoreview, uh, Minnesota. So All Creation Sings and we are invited to join the song. And thrilling moments call for exuberance. Let everything that has breath praise God and raise a loud shout, all you peoples. Yet we also experience creation calling us to stillness. We hush, we take a deep breath, we barely whisper in awe of what surrounds us. Just as the Psalms express a wide range of emotions for the times in our lives, as we were reminded this morning, other hymns and songs do so as well. 
This pertains not only to what the text express, but the expression of the music itself. The sonic landscape is rich and varied. All Creation Sings includes a diversity of genres and expression. The sonic landscape includes Tze chants, German chorale tunes, dance and folk tunes from many peoples and places, the spirituals, and more. Some were composed in the past decade and others have been sung for centuries. One example of a newer tune and text pairing is As Rivers Flow from a Distant Spring. Hymn writer and hymn society member and our introducer today, Dave Bjorlin, uses the rivers, trees, and woods as examples of our witness in the world. And it's paired with a new tune by William Beckstrand. Let's listen to an excerpt. We are invited to praise God, our creator, not only in diverse musical styles, but in many languages. 25 of the 200 hymns and songs in All Creation Sings include text in Spanish. Other languages are included as well. In a moment, we'll hear two hymns. The first, Hallelujah, Sing Praise to Your Creator, is found in the Praise Thanksgiving section of the book and is based on Psalm 148. The tune is a Batak, Indonesian melody and is preferably sung unaccompanied. This will be followed by immediately by a hymn in the creation section, When at last the rain falls. The hymn writer, both the Spanish text and tune, Pablo Fernandez Badillo, was a teacher in Puerto Rico's public schools. This delightful tune with a triplet pattern in the refrain places us in a dance with the plants and the flowers. And with them, we are called to sing with all of creation to our maker.
surge con verdor, toda la floresta renueva la creación. Mira el rojo lirio, el duende ya brotó, bella primavera que anuncia su fulgor. Toda flor silvestre, la maya, el cundiamor, como manifiestan la gloria del Señor, como se te alaba en toda la creación, yo quisiera hacerlo en forma igual, Señor. Several songs in All Creation Sings have a more meditative quality and can be paired with generous silence in a contemplative setting. These shorter songs would be fitting as part of the service of word and prayer, which is one of the liturgical settings provided in the resource. One short song that might be a new discovery is In the Peace of God, Find Rest. The text is by Joy Patterson and Thomas Plavetchko composed the tune. Thank you, Jen. I'm John White and happy to be here with my colleagues, Jennifer and David. Um, and as David Bjorn noted, I uh, serve as executive for worship in the ELCA and our offices are in Chicago, but I'm coming to you from my home today, just up the road in Racine, Wisconsin. We began this webinar with David Sims singing, now the heavens start to whisper as the veil is growing thin. The phrase thin place is a term from Celtic Christianity that refers to those experiences where the distance between heaven and earth collapses, where there seems to be not much separation between us and the divine. In a hymn based on parables, hymn writer Adam Tice asks, what is the world like when God's will is done? The series of questions set to a new tune by Sally Ann Morris challenges us to recognize and enact a world where God's work is done, born through our voices, our hands, and our hearts. What is the world like sings of life growing in unexpected places? Our sin turns us in ourselves, preventing us from noticing Christ in one another. In the hymn, Spirit, Open My Heart, Ruth Duck has crafted a prayer set to an Irish melody that asks God to replace our stony hearts with kind and tender ones. The veil growing thin can also be a helpful image for recognizing what we share as the human family, even among our differences. Another hymn by Mel Bringle, Commonwealth is God's Commandment, number 1036 in All Creation Sings, includes the word for peace in five languages. In singing together, we are praying for that place where grace is found in our beautiful diversity. Let's sing stanza one. Please. 
cartoon. We may also experience the veil growing thin when receiving the body and blood of Christ in Holy Communion. There are 11 hymns in All Creation Sings uh, in the Holy Communion category, but our, the topical index also suggests at least 10 more that are especially appropriate for, to sing at Communion. Some give us fresh new language to sing about the sacrament. Others offer short songs that, when repeated several times, allow worshipers to sing freely as they move about the worship space to receive Holy Communion. One such example from the Caribbean, we come now to your table, Lord, uh, might even encourage uh, some dancing to the table. from creation. Now is the right time to sing. Shout and whisper while the veil is growing thin around us. So how should we respond? Our first response is one of gratitude. Gratitude it requires that we know and acknowledge who came before us. All Creation Sings contains brand new hymns, but also gems from the past, like Jesus Christ, our blessed Savior, which comes from the earliest Lutheran hymnal or spirituals from the African-American tradition, or now the daylight fills the sky from Lutheran Book of Worship. Besides our Lutheran hymnal ancestors, we are grateful for our ecumenical hymnal siblings, whose collections inspired our own and served as sources of texts and tunes. We're also grateful for the community of saints to which we belong. Hymn 958, To Christ Belong, In Christ Behold, has a very specific story as a hymn written to commemorate a congregation's 100th anniversary. But it's included in All Creation Sings because of its universal story, reminding us that we are bound to all the saints of every time and place through our baptism. And it's from that heritage that God's wonders still unfold. Let's listen to a bit of it. text is by Susan Briel and the tune was by uh, Robert Buckley Farley. That was one of the hymns that uh, when this last year would be really feel overwhelming and isolating, I would go and play um, from just my own benefit. Where Shepherds Lately Knelt is a Christmas hymn in the All Creation Sings Christmas uh, section. It's a collaboration between Yaroslav Vida and Karl Schock. Vida's text places Jesus's birth in the middle of the hymn's timeline. The texts give thanks for Isaiah, whose prophecies foretold the birth, for the shepherds who knelt in wonder, and finally gives thanks that we too are present in the Christmas story. 
Let Us Enter In uh, by a Lutheran hymnal, uh, hymn writer Ray McKeever uh, is a sending, sending hymn, even though it says enter in its title. Uh, it's written in the language uh, of a gathering hymn, even though we're being sent out. Each time we are sent from worship, we are entering the world with thanksgiving and freedom. Stanza two might have my favorite line. Let us enter into the place where our God has proceeded. It is in gratitude that we can acknowledge all those who have come before us, singing praise and freedom before we were even born. Let's sing a stanza or two of Let Us Enter In. <clears throat> Let us enter into the song of thanksgiving and freedom. Let us enter into the long line of people in need. Let us enter into the strong mind that God is still living, healing, forgiving. Let us enter in. Let us enter into the place where our God has preceded. Let us enter into the face of the fear and the pain. Let us enter into the grace of the love when it's needed. Death is defeated. Let us enter in. Thanks, David. When we respond, to God in song, we are invited to bring our whole selves, the wonder of who we are. Theologian musician Don Saliers would say that worship involves humanity at full stretch before God. Bernadette Farrell's, O oh God, You Search Me, is one of two hymns in all creation sings that draws upon Psalm 139 a psalm that approaches God from our very core. And while the song uses I language when sung by a community, that I can become a we, as Martin reminded us just a bit ago, I'll sing um, the first and final stanzas of this hymn. However, we have been made to feel that we cannot bring our whole truest selves before God. We can sing of this too. Note uh, the words from the hymn, God We Gather as Your People by David Bowman. This is stanza three. Oh, we pray for all the young lives cut short by fear and shame so afraid of who they are and whom they love. May the message now be banished that your love is for the few. May their faith in you renew. Let's sing together uh, the first and third stanzas of this hymn. Thank you. 
church has often missed the mark when it comes to singing true welcome for all. Yet there has been a serious effort in All Creation Sings to offer more inclusive and expansive imagery in the texts of our song. And while not directly related to assembly song, All Creation Sings includes an index entitled Scriptural Images for God. Perhaps this listing of images from scripture could assist not only prayer writers and preachers, but hymn and songwriters as well. Part of expressing the core of who we are is acknowledging where we have failed and confessing sin. Several songs do this, but the hymn Wind and Cold Roar, Corre el Viento, does this with such specificity, asking forgiveness for the fact that Many have warm homes, wool clothes to wear. This is so unfair. Forgive us, Lord. And the refrain concludes each verse, for the things we crave and seek to win cost our neighbor's loss. Forgive us, Lord. Responding with the core of who we are also means an awareness of aging and sickness, in that even though our bodies change and decline, God's spirit abides. The next hymn, Let My Spirit Always Sing, is an honest, beautiful text from the late Hymn Society fellow Shirley Arena Murray. It's paired with lush harmonies composed by the late Jane Marshall. We'll hear the first two stanzas, and then this will be followed by This Is My Body, a short song suitable for communion, composed by Anne Krantz Organ. Indeed, though we are broken, we are blessed.
We bring our whole selves in our response to God, expressing both praise, delight, and lament. As O oh God We Call, one of the shorter songs in All Creation Sings remind us, our, our response is a calling on God. O oh God We Call, O oh God We Call, from deep inside we yearn, from deep inside we yearn, from deep inside we yearn for you. Another shorter song that may be a new discovery to you is Anointing Fall on Me. This song has been a staple in many congregations since it was first released in 1992 on the album Urban Praise from Kingsway Music. Its creator, Don Thomas, is an ordained minister in the Church of God in Christ. The text seems to take its inspiration from 2 Corinthians, where Paul explains that spiritual anointing with the Holy Spirit is conferred upon Christians by God. We respond to God in praise. The category praise, thanksgiving, praise and thanksgiving in all creation sings includes 14 hymns and songs. But of course, there are many others throughout the resource that express our praise. One of these hymns of praise in a deep unbounded darkness is set to the plain song chant Divinum Mysterium, which we know often sung to of, of the Father's love begotten. In this hymn, we sing our praise as long as heart and breath endure. And yet our response to God is also cries of lament. Evangelical Lutheran worship introduced a category of lament and All Creation Sings builds on this by including several new hymns to both new and familiar tunes. Saint Columba, which we often know uh, with, associated with the text, The King of Love, My Shepherd Is, is paired with a new hymn by Jeanette Lindholm, Before the Waters Nourished the Earth.
And like some of the psalms of lament that take a turn toward praise, this hymn concludes, The love that called creation good, all goodness still is bringing. The love turns death again to life and silence into singing. All Creation Sings includes many options for singing our praise, including this Easter hymn that begins, Earth, Earth, Awake, Your Praises Sing. In what seems to be an echo of joy to the world, all nature is singing. We have the duty and delight of joining all the ends of the earth, singing praise to the triune God in words and tunes, both familiar and new. There is so much more um, that we could say and that we wish that we could share. Um, their All Creation Sings website uh, at augsburgfortress.org um, has links to blog posts and recordings and previous webinars that we've done uh, as an overview to the book, as one just about the hymns, one just about the liturgy. Uh, so there's so much more that you could uh, explore uh, in terms of uh, learning about the development and the, its content. Uh, so, of course, today's uh, overview of the book is, is just one way uh, to explore this worship book, and it doesn't have a single narrative point of view. But All Creation Sings was conceived with a point of view, that the church's worship is always unfolding, that we are part of creation, neither separate from it nor at its center, that every person is a beloved child of God, and that the love of God who created singing as part of nature can be found on every page. Let's close by singing a stanza or two of the final hymn, O Beauty Ever Ancient. to a time of questions. Um, uh, if you can feel free to use the, the Q&A box in, in, here in Zoom. Um, it's been a joy to um, scroll through some of the, the chat um, and hear uh, some of, many of the writers of these hymns are, are with us today and commenting, and others are commenting about when they first heard certain hymns at hymn society events. Um, and I think that just goes to show the, the influence that this organization um, has um, on, on our body of assembly song in throughout all of our churches. I know I can remember at one of our early meetings, you know, when we were just beginning to think about um, receiving suggestions about hymns, one of the resources we looked at was hymn society conference books. You know, we brought them all and flipped through them on our table. So um, definitely um, much influence from this, this organization. I'm not seeing any questions in the Q and A, um, but uh, but I have a, a question for you. Uh, is there a selection for each of you that got included that was surprising to you? Like once the process was done, you thought to yourself, "Oh, wow, that one made it in," or "I didn't see that one coming." What a what a blessing, or you know, any any kind of a surprise. That's a great question. And then Mel Bringle did ask a question in the Q and A, so we've got more to chew on. If you need if you need time to think about my question, we could we could go back to Mel's and 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 then come back.
I, I felt like there were so many surprises um, in the suggestions <laughs> that came in. So it's hard to it's hard to didn't nail down one. We had well over a thousand suggestions and submissions that had to get down to two hundred. Wow! So, wow! Um, um, there's obviously a lot of great hymnody that didn't make it into the two hundred as well. But, um, well, let's let's jump to. Oh, unless you, David, you look like you're about to jump in now. All right. So Mel asks. And maybe this is like an ongoing question for the Hymn Society to always be chewing on. What do you think should be the, quote, life expectancy for a hymnal prior to the need to come out with a supplement? That is a good question. Um, it's been in our Lutheran ELCA history that um, our primary hymnals have been around for about 30 years and at about halfway through that, is, is when a supplement um, rolled out. Um, so that having that timeline, I think, is what started the conversation about all creation things, but I don't think it was guaranteed, even at the beginning of this process, that that, that was the right timeline. But the more we talked about it and um, talked about what, a, what, a, what the church needed at the time and still having a curated collection of hymns um, at about the 15-year mark since the last primary uh, worship book still seemed right at this time. I don't know if Jen or David have other That's thoughts. That's exactly what I was going to say, but I wondered in your question, Mel, like you, you wonder about how time changes, like that worked this time, but you, you have to wonder for the future, like it, will that shift? Will that, will, it, are things accelerating and, and how we are approaching um, tune and text um, accelerating in a way that will compress that or will um, the question about bound uh, printed resources change that. So I, I think it's a really excellent question to think about um, as we continue to move forward and think about um, supplemental resources. Uh, another question I have is uh, as far as digital resources that came along or that what digital resources are either available now with this or are you thinking about doing and and maybe what what was that process like of thinking through is this going to be a bound collection is it going to be online is it going to be a hybrid and if so uh you know how will that work was that a big discussion for y'all it was um so uh augsburg fortress um has uh several subscription websites called sundaysandseasons.com and uh prelude music planner and between the two of them uh they provide either um, tiff files of all the of all the hymns um, or pdfs of the accompaniments um, and so there, there is digital availability as well as all the texts of all the liturgies i mean that that's our that's our way of uh, just one of our ways of distributing that to, to um, churches um, so we everything is available or will soon be available um, in the in those same ways where you could download individual graphics you could um, get accompaniments um, we're working on an ebook uh, version. Uh, we're in the final testing stages of that, so you could put it on your iPad. And we found people using that a lot, at least I have, for worship planning, uh, that you can have it just on your, on your device. Um, but we also have so many churches who have very little internet. Um, they have you know 25 people, and they're in once a week. And so we knew that a bound collection was still uh, needed for a lot of, a lot of our congregations. Um, so I, I think uh, we decided to make it focused on the printed resource. So the digital files are versions of what you see on the page. You know, they're, that's that's where they take their, their that's how they live, um, and we refer to things by the page numbers of the print, of the physical thing. So I, I I felt like in our in our conversations with with um, churches, we just the the consensus was that it was still going to be based around a bound edition. Yeah. And Mel's question that just came in the Q&A uh, is, is essentially a follow-up to this. Are, are you finding congregations receptive to a supplement or are they still thinking that the former hymnal is too new to warrant supplementing? Probably yes to both. <laughs> yes to, yeah. Depends uh, yeah. on which congregation. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, 
there are, in fact, we know of congregations that are only just now adopting evangelical Lutheran worship, even as they're coming out of the pandemic now. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. But then also others who, who know ELW so well um, and have been craving um, what is next. So, yeah. We run the, run the bread. Right. Have you, have you found, um, have you found congregations to be s skipping a generation of hymnal? Uh, I've, I've seen that in Methodist congregations where they, they like skipped a generation of hymnal, but then, so they just upgraded all the way to the new one. And I think some glory, I think some Presbyterians did that where they stayed with the, what the 1960s book or something, and then they jumped straight to glory to God. Um, and, and has that affected the, uh, the supplement in any way for those types of people. Um, I do know of a few congregations who, who skipped from the red 1958 service of book and hymnal to the 2006 ELW. Mm -hmm. um, and some say that some people didn't notice because they were similar in color, but I, I find that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there are still many congregations that still are, are maybe who haven't adopted ELW and are using mm -hmm. the Green Lutheran Book of Worship. And so while we, while All Creation Things was designed as a supplement to ELW, we mm -hmm. did have in the back of our mind that some congregations would pair it with an older generation. Right. So they're using it as a supplement to an older denominational hymnal. Interesting. Um, all right, uh, Louise uh, Mundinger, uh, what about streaming permissions? Is this is every hymn covered in your hymnal as far as streaming? No, that's up to the individual rights holders. Um, right. So we we have licenses, obviously, to to um, for the print products, um, but not all of them want it on our our digital uh, delivery systems for Sundays and Seasons. And then beyond that, it's you know not all of them would be covered by a blanket license um, by one license. So uh, there's just there was we decided to go for the content and for the the main published volume. Um, even if that meant that, I don't know, two of them out of the 200 or something um, don't want their digital files uh, available for download. Um, so the vast majority are. Um, there might be one or two that uh, we're still working on that. Um, but churches are responsible for their own, um, their own licensing. I'm assuming that the majority of them are covered either under one license or CCLI yep. and that, that there's just a couple of oddballs that or kind of fall outside of the of those major licensing services. Yep, that's yeah, exactly it would right. only be one or two, if any. I think that would fall outside of yeah. both licenses combined. Right, right. Um, Carl Bear asks, "How did the committee understand the purpose or purposes of a supplement? Expanding on the ELW, experimentation, correcting aspects of the ELW, etc." I would say. Uh, Yes, to some of that. I mean, it. It we um, talk about it being hand in hand. That we understand it as a supplement. We know there's ten liturgical settings in ELW, and there's two here. Um, it's not as in depth, but it is meant to um, to enhance and to and, and to supplement what's there. But at the same time, we realize that there has been a lot of changes in the world, and a lot of changes in our churches since 2006. And so, in that regard, that it is. Um, providing uh, new ways to new fresh language and um, new uh, varieties of, of tune and text balance and, and the like. So um, it's, it's a little bit of, of both. Uh, Peter Raywald says, I'm serving a two point parish right now as their interim pastor. One uses the ELW and the other LBW and WOV, which I assume means a lot to people who know all those letters. Um, when, when I asked why they were still using the older resources, they said, the harmonies disappeared in ELW. While this is not entirely true, many hymns in ELW only have the melody line, and this parish loves to sing in congregational harmony. How did you decide which hymns to have in harmony in the Pew edition for ACS and which to have melody only? Uh, the rule is that if the harmony was uh, singable by a congregation, then it's in the book, uh, both in ELW and in uh, All Creation Sings. And if it's not uh, a congregational accompaniment, 
um, then it only appears as a, a melody only. Um, the uh, the trade-off, so that, that's me talking as a member, um, uh, an employee of the publisher. Um, me, as, a, as a, a person who grew up stealing um, a hymn from, it was Eric Routley's Rejoice in the Lord, I wanted that hymnal from my Presbyterian church, taking it home and playing it all. I loved that I could have access to all those accompaniments. So there is a part of me that realizes that having um, only the congregation's part in the pew edition means that it is harder for everyone to access and accompany those hymns. However, here's the, here's the size of ELW if um, all the accompaniments were included in it. And this doesn't have any of the liturgies in it. So everyone in the hip, in the hymn, you know, the pews and the would have to be holding this book um, for them to have that same experience. So the that is driven by content and by the desire for as many voices to be represented. Um, deciding that that is more important than um, a twelve-year-old nerd taking the hymnal home and learning all the accompaniments. Um, but I I hold both of those in my heart. So that's my personal answer. Uh, it, it, another, I guess, tangential question to this or related question is uh, there, there, as genres and cultures are expanded in representation within a book like this, there are implied harmonies uh, or performance practice harmonies that would not necessarily be notated. And I wonder, such as in a gospel selection, right, you would just have a lead sheet with the melody maybe, and but then there's a three-part kind of implied harmony that would happen or certain improvised harmonies in some various rote song or cyclical genres. Um, did you did you do any fleshing out of those harmonies in the printed scores or did you kind of leave those as implied? Uh, we did some of both. Um, so like some of them, like there's a, uh, there's a hallelujah from um, that Syrian in origin and we provided chords for it but we didn't brace it with the, the rest of the music. So what you see in the accompaniment edition is just what you see in the, in the pew edition, just the, just the melody line. And then underneath it, down on the page, as if to imply, you really shouldn't do this. Here's some chords for like teaching it to your congregate, you know, your choir or something, or I, I don't know, like here's some help, yeah. but like by the fact that we've separated it, you probably shouldn't do it. Um, That's clever. Then for things like um, Anointing Fall on Me that John played and sang, um, we provided a four-part harmonization. Um, but then also there's a, there's a YouTube video of a guy named Jonathan Newsom teaching how to play that in a gospel style. Um, so I found out who he was and I wrote to him and I played that, that YouTube video one second at a time and I transcribed what he was doing. And that's in the accompaniment edition as an alternate accompaniment. Um, for the for the pianist to have. So what John was playing is you can buy in the accompaniment volume um, as a way to say that um, this is not useful for the whole congregation, but this is uh, one way to render this song in a more uh, faithful um, uh, accompaniment that not all of us uh, are as comfortable with. So we provided some of that as well. So it, I, I think that was sort of a case by case basis, but we mm -hmm. did we did think about that. Would you agree? Yeah. John and Jim. Yeah, I think so, and I think. Um, it also speaks that, especially some of the, the helps in the accompaniment edition, um, that um, some some contexts and some musicians maybe need a little more guidance in that. Um, and so to offer some of those suggestions, um, as, especially as congregations are learning, learning new music, we thought was helpful. But also there are some notes throughout the accompaniment edition that might um, guide, uh, suggest performance practice as well um, in other ways. I'll add, there's also some, some notes in the Pew edition, which is a new feature that was not in ELW. There's some narrative notes on, on just a, on a few of the hymns and um, usually related to um, pronunciation or translation or mm -hmm. to use. Um, but those notes are a little different than what's in the accompaniment edition, which is geared specifically to the musician who's leading. Well, thank you all so much. Uh, we are at the hour mark and we still have some more sessions to go later on today. So I look forward to seeing you all in these other sessions in the afternoon and for our evening event. Um, thank you all for your work uh, and everything you've done and congratulations. And uh, I hope the rollout continues to go well for you all. Take care. <laughs>